Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga Night 60. My guest tonight is a former cabinet minister, Mary M. Maasef. Uh, she was the member of parliament for Peterborough, I believe, wasn't it? Uh, that uh, uh, And, and uh, a couple months ago, I read a post about the one-year anniversary of her loss in the last federal election. And uh, and it was really quite an interesting and uh, and and provocative and uh, heartwarming and heartbreaking in some ways uh, uh, um, article and post about uh, about the experience of losing. And so I thought it would be interesting to reach out to Miriam and talk about her experience as a candidate, her experience as a member of parliament, her experience as a cabinet minister, um, and then her experience in the election losing. So Miriam, welcome to the show. How are you? I am well, Brian. How are you doing? Excellent. Thank you. Are you coming to us from Peterborough now? I am joining you live from my home in Peterborough, Kawartha. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much for doing so. So tell me about uh, about your experience. Well, all of it. Yeah. Let me, start. let me begin with, I, I tried to, to become the mayor of Peterborough and I failed. I came within uh, about 1,300 votes back in 2014 and I was pretty devastated. I was an unknown. I according to some, had come out of nowhere, even though I had been involved in the community for years. And when I lost that election, I thought the world was over. Oh, little did I know that a few days after that election, a new door and a new opportunity would open up. I ran for the Liberal nomination. I won within just a handful of votes. And my name was on the ballot in the 2015 election to represent the very kind people of Peterborough Kawartha in Ottawa. I won and election night, I still couldn't believe that I had won and that we had won a majority. And then a few days after that, I found myself uh, being asked uh, if I wanted to serve as a cabinet minister. And so as you can appreciate, life since 2015 has been quite a ride and I had the opportunity to serve my community in Ottawa to serve as a federal cabinet minister for close to six years and since the election a year ago I've taken the time to you know heal recover and I've started my own business onward now works particularly with women leaders to fill the gaps uh, to provide the leadership support so that when we women get elected, get promoted. When we're around the big boys and girls table, we have the tools to succeed and to survive and thrive. What was it like losing? Well, look, losing is awful. Losing an election is awful. It's public. You put your heart and soul into it. You've got a team around you. And for me, you know, I felt like I let my team down. I had lost an opportunity to serve my community. It took time to recover from it, Brian. It truly did. Uh, but that loss and perspective helps. That loss was not even close to the worst loss I've experienced in my life. Nobody died. I was given resources to cope with that loss. I'd had an opportunity to serve. So I had a series of accomplishments under my belt. I had met incredible people and people in the community who I continue to call friends. So not all was lost, but for anybody who's lost anything, and we're hearing a lot about you know, people at Twitter and Amazon and Facebook getting laid off, losing a job is terrible. Losing it publicly is even worse, but it's not even close to the end of the world. And since then, I've taken that defeat and poured my energy and my reflections into my next endeavor. Now, I would have thought that Peterborough is not the most uh, liberal stronghold riding in uh, in the country. Uh, and so therefore, uh, frankly, uh, if you, you know, winning obviously had, had a lot to do with you as the candidate, um, but also that the 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 incumbent uh, had some big challenges uh, previous uh, to uh, uh, to your arrival, um, and and I think people were surprised that you won and uh, pleasantly surprised. It was it was not a a a for sure win, um, and and so therefore it wasn't a uh, a logical uh, uh, riding in a minority kind of situation, which ended up being the reality for the Liberal Party at the time. Uh, it wasn't uh, one of the ridings you'd say you'd win for sure. So No, it's not an easy riding to win for progressives. Um, no woman has 
prior to myself had been able to represent Peterborough in Ottawa, not for there being a lack of great women running in different parties. It just had never happened before. And then they chose me. <laughs> and, you know, you're right, Brian, a lot of it, um, you know, you've got to have a great team. And I had the very best. Uh, and we ran a very long campaign, the one of the longest in modern Canadian history. Um, and yes, the previous candidate had difficulties uh, and got in trouble with Elections Canada. Uh, but one of the things that you realize uh, in party politics, um, any candidate that runs knows that they play a very small part in the victory or defeat. So you got to give it everything you got. And one of the things that every candidate at, at any order of government who decides to put their name on a ballot has to come to terms with is, okay, what if I win? Uh, and, you know, hopefully that's what you're thinking about every single day. And that's what's motivating you and your team. But you also got to make peace with the possibility of losing. And certainly that that potential was great in 2015. Uh, so I did make peace and I did for the next two elections as well with the possibility of losing. Um, but the 2021 loss uh, was particularly difficult because going into it, I wasn't 100 percent in election mode. My my head was focused on what was going on in Afghanistan. And what we're seeing was a severe decline in everything that folks had worked for for the last two decades. And so, you know, when you're going into an election to anybody watching who's thinking about putting their name on a ballot, first of all, let me say I highly recommend it. It's difficult work, but I highly recommend it. There's a lot of unknowns. There are a lot of risks. You're taking a really big risk, but I highly, highly recommend it. But once you do, if your head isn't in the game 100%, if, you know, you're not training for it like, you know, athletes train for a big race or a big game, uh, then you're reducing your probability of winning. So just make sure your head's in it. And of course, surround yourself with the very best of people, which I had every step of the way. What a fascinating uh you know, up and down uh, that you've uh, gone through. And uh, the fact that you've come through it uh, with such resilience and a positive attitude is, uh, I think, an example to all of us. And so uh, I congratulate you for that. And thank you for your example. Uh, we're going to take a break uh, for some messages and come back uh, with the Honorable Maryam and Saf in just two minutes. And we're going to talk a little bit about her experience in cabinet and uh, some of the portfolios that uh, she has held. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, Afghanistan. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, women's rights, because uh, that's something that uh, she's uh, spoken about. Uh, we're going to talk about diversity and inclusion. And uh, um, I, I told her just before we got on the show that uh, I heard her on CBC Radio, I think it was four or five years ago, and I, I, I ironically had just tweeted, uh, a memory came up of my tweet about uh, about her incredible performance on, on, the, on the radio. Um, and then we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about uh, about resilience and getting through tough times. Um, stay with us, everyone. It's going to be a fascinating conversation tonight. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. It's a real honor of mine to be chatting with Maryam Mossef, the Honorable Maryam Mossef, who is a, a former member of parliament, a former cabinet minister, um, and uh, someone who uh, I think inspired a lot of us uh, with her attitudes toward uh, her job. Um, and uh, and in a recent um, article and uh, post that she made on social media, uh, inspired us with her resilience in dealing with uh, defeat. Uh, and so I want to talk about a lot of those. But let's come back, if we could, uh, to uh, your experience as a cabinet minister. You were newly elected, and right away you were invited to join uh, the cabinet. And uh, if I've got it right here, uh, the first position was um, Minister of Women and Gender Equality. And then, uh, is that not right? And the, then uh, Minister the first of Status appointment, No, the first appointment was, actually, can we pause here for a second? Can we just like edit this? Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight, and I'm really honored to be chatting with her, is uh, the Honorable Maryam Mossef. She is a uh, former 
member of parliament, former cabinet minister. Uh, currently, she's CEO of her own company, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But uh, um, she, uh, a little while ago, posted on social media and wrote an article about the experience of losing, and uh, and and she lost uh, in the last federal election. And I, I read it, and I was really moved. Um, I'm moved by... Um, you know, what she described uh, as the challenge, but also what she described is how she got through it and the resilience. And uh, and I think it's a great example for all of us because all of us go through some tough times and some losses and some job losses uh, and particularly some very public uh, job losses. And so I think that her whole experience and that she wanted to talk about it, uh, I think uh, was uh, was really um was really helpful and uh, and and interesting uh, uh, and 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 an example to all of us. But uh, if we could, uh, um, uh, Ms. Monsef, can we go back and go through your uh, cabinet history? So you were, is it correct, you were appointed in that very first cabinet that uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau um, appointed after his uh, his surprise majority election? That's right. Part of the first 50-50 women and men equal numbers at a federal cabinet. For a first time member of parliament, that's got to be pretty spectacular. It was so many things. It was an honor, just like it's an honor to be here with you and to be talking to your listeners tonight. Um, it was an incredible opportunity, uh, but it was also a trial by fire. I didn't go to school uh, for a political science degree. I don't come from a long line of politicians in my family. I was an activist turned politician. And as we talked earlier, you know, very few people actually thought that I could win. So to win the seat and to have a seat in the par in the in Canada's parliament was a big enough deal on its own. But then to be appointed to cabinet on a hot potato of a file was a whole other ball game. So what was the first cabinet post? I was appointed Minister of Democratic Institutions. And why was it a hot potato file? Because anytime there are attempts to change the rules uh, that govern elections, there is likely to be a lot of diverse opinions. Uh, and it became, we didn't know it at the time, but it became a political hot potato because uh, it was in many ways, an existential issue for many parties. Uh, so, you know, for some, they had seats to gain if a certain system was chosen over another and you know they felt strongly about that and for others they stood to lose seats uh, where they were currently very comfortable uh, and those who cared about this issue felt very strongly about it uh, and the majority of Canadians uh, either weren't engaged or weren't aware and so building consensus amongst those who wanted change was a was quite a task uh, and you know one of the things that I'd go on to learn was those countries that have seen success in reform often see reform only after a crisis and right. Canadian democracy was not in crisis so making that case was difficult and I was a rookie politician you know I gotta own that there are things if I could go back there are things that I would do differently uh, and we weren't just asking to change the way the vote is counted. We were asking Canadians, do you want mandatory voting? Do you want online voting? And certainly my my first job, my first task, day 29 on the job, uh, was changing the way that senators were appointed uh, to parliament by the prime minister. And so it began on quite a political footing and it continued that way. So ironically, uh... Your predecessor in the position was Pierre Polyev. That's right. Interesting That's right. over a civil service that reported to him before you showed up on the job. Well, uh, you know, the Canada's public service employees are highly professional and, you know, they they never speak ill of anybody. They keep it really professional in many ways, but I knew, and you know, one of the reasons why so many people in my community and across the country were motivated to put an end to the uh, regime before us was the attempts to limit democracy, to limit democratic participation. I was talking to a student earlier today who's working on, on a project at U of T, 
Uh, and we spoke about the ways that vouching, for example, uh, was being eliminated by the previous government, that the voter information card, which became part of the habit of voting for many, was eliminated. Uh, and, you know, there were attempts uh, to limit participation in our democratic institutions. So, yeah, it was interesting to, you know, get into a role that was already political and then try to undo some of the things that had been put in place and then change the way senators were appointed. I'm really proud of that Senate appointment process, by the way. It's not been an easy journey, but to date, there have been over 60 senators appointed using this independent, nonpartisan process that the prime minister had asked me to put in place. Uh, and for the first time in the history of Confederation, there is an equal number of women and men in that place, uh, but there's also more diversity in backgrounds, expertise than there has ever been, which bodes well for democracy. No, qu no question. Um, now, the criticism uh, that uh, certainly uh, the prime minister gets is that, uh, and it's quoted all the time, something like 1,500 times they say that he said this is going to be the last election under first uh, by the post uh, during the 2015 uh, election campaign. I personally uh, am very supportive of proportional representation, um, uh, mandatory voting, reducing the voting age. What do you think should happen? Uh, what would you, if you if you had that magic wand and you could actually change our voting system, what would you change it to? Well, first of all, the thing that I'd want for my magic wand is the ability to make sure that whatever the change is has the broad support of Canadians. Because if you make a change, and if you don't have, say, two thirds of the House of Commons in favor of it, uh, and or a broad uh, range of Canadians on board, what you've essentially done is put at risk the integrity of the system. So putting in jeopardy people's confidence in democracy is dangerous, and it only weakens it. And we've seen it, for example, in the U.S., when a candidate loses and doesn't believe that it was indeed a loss, what they can do is call into question the integrity of the whole system. And doing so does favors to no one except those who seek to create chaos and break down democracy. So if it were up to me, certainly young people today, they care and they know so much. And I seriously believe that they're the most powerful generation to have ever lived. They care about climate change. They care about reconciliation. They care, care about equity, inclusion, and they have at their fingertips the most powerful tool that our species has ever known. This little device allows them to learn all sorts of things. So I support the opportunity for young people to vote at a younger age. And certainly we've seen in places like Australia that mandatory voting can be a strong way of increasing participation. If if I were uh, to go back to those early days as a cabinet minister, as a politician, what I would have sought was like, let's let's pick a system and it would probably be a hybrid of a very variety of systems. Let's pick a system. Let's make the case for it. Let's make sure that there's broad support for it, because, you know, either way, there will be criticism. Uh, but as long as the end goal is protecting the integrity and the strength of our democratic institutions, that is solid footing to be on. Let me ask you one question about mandatory voting. Uh, you know, my sense is that uh, political parties spend way too much time identifying the vote and getting it out and not enough time actually talking to people to try to persuade them of the benefits of their policies. And and it's almost as if you and actually I met someone just last night uh, who told me that they were campaigning in a by-election um, and uh, they were doing what they called targeted canvassing. Uh, and I asked them, what's targeted canvassing? They said, we don't even bother going to the uh, people of the other political party that, we, uh, 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 that we've got identified uh, to, to talk to because we don't want to wake them up. Uh, we don't want to alert them that there's a by-election. I said, that's terrible. You should be out knocking on every door trying to persuade people. They only go to the doors that they think uh, are going to be voting. Um, and so if it was mandatory voting, and you knew everyone or almost everyone was actually going to go to the polls, you wouldn't spend all this time just identifying the vote and getting it out because you know that everyone's going to come out. What you spend your time doing is actually going to the doors and trying to persuade them of the positive of your position. 
And you wouldn't have this vote suppression um, because, you know, they were going to go there. So vote suppression doesn't make any sense. So wouldn't that lead to a far more positive situation in uh, campaigns? As you're talking, Brian, I'm recalling, you know, thousands of conversations across the country in that first year. There's a lot of things I would do differently, but something we did right and we did very well. Uh, my team and I went to every province and every territory. We went to rural communities and we went to large urban centers. And we engaged in a conversation where people, you know, sat in triads, they sat in, you know, circles of three, and we had these conversations and we got really rich feedback in return for the time that they had invested, that we had invested. And there are a variety of ways that democracy can be improved. And the notion that folks accepted across the country is as long as we recognize that when we introduce one change, there's the possibility, a strong possibility of a trade-off with another consequence, right? So think about the voting system as part of an ecosystem of different tools that hold Canadian democracy together. And you make one small tweak here, you've affected changes here that may or may not be favorable to a strong democracy. So do I think that uh, there are opportunities to further strengthen the way elections are run um, by different political parties. Yes. Do I think candidates work their butts off to try and persuade uh, both, you know, folks who are known to be supportive of their political stripe and those who are not? Absolutely. I know in my own community, we had one of the highest number of debates in the whole country. The challenge, though, is when people come to the debates, have they already made up their minds? Yes. Can you? Exactly. So can you can you further strengthen the current platforms that exist that allow citizens to better understand who they're voting for so that it brings in a wider audience? I think yes. Uh, and one of the key lessons from that whole process of electoral reform was, and if I ever write a book, it will it will it will include some of this, is you know, identify what problem it is we're trying to solve. Because there's so many different ideas and opinions about how things should be and how things can be. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve? And second, one of the common areas of consensus. That, that we found in every corner of the country was starting at a young age. It's not just about the parties and it's not just about the candidates. Democracy is a two-way street. And think of it as a use it or lose it system. The more you engage in it during elections, between elections, the stronger it gets and the less people engage, the weaker it gets. But if you start at a younger age and build the habit of voting, parents who take their kids to the polls, schools that have mock elections for the same candidates that are running in real life uh, in the community. Those are ways that you build that habit of voting and voter engagement uh, that can only strengthen the system moving forward and encourage folks to keep an open mind. Your second portfolio was, uh, was status of women or uh, women inequality, gender inequality? What I started out as was uh, the Minister for Status of Women, which at the time was an agency of another federal department. I got appointed to that role about 10 days before Mr. Trump took his oath in office. Uh, and, you know, we were able to make the case that the department responsible for advocating and strengthening the status of women ought to be more in line with 21st century realities around gender inclusion, and that it should have the same powers and authorities and responsibilities as any other minister around the table. The prime minister agreed, and the agency became a full department, equal to other departments under the law in 2018, and we changed the name to Women and Gender Equality. What was that experience like? Oh, that was, 
I mean, it had never been done before, uh, changing an agency into a full and equal department, not to the best of our knowledge and research as a team. So it involved, you know, first making the case and then picking up the phone and talking to those who had held my portfolio prior to me uh, and, you know, speaking to Madam Bradshaw, for example, speaking to uh, former clerks of the Privy Council, speaking to, uh, you know, former cabinet ministers and senators and representatives, activists and advocates, getting their ideas on what structure, what processes, what kind of mandate, what name the department should have. All that was incredibly exciting. And then we did it. But, you know, it's still a, a, a department in its infancy, and it definitely punches above its weight. When I started the budget that Status of Women had to provide funding to organizations across the country, you know, serving 36, 37 million Canadians was around $20 million per year. And when I left, that number had increased to over $200 million. We were serving over 6 million women and children and gender diverse folks in every corner of the country. We were introducing programs and strengthening programs that built up the capacity of organizations that, you know, support women and children in their most vulnerable moments in life. Uh, we were supporting and giving opportunities for women to leave abusive relationships, but we were also investing in their economic security, particularly post-pandemic recovery. And we were investing in strengthening women's leadership. We had capacity to support initiatives around the G7, where for the first time ever, we had uh, women and, you know, some of the most impressive feminists in Canada and around the world speaking to, you know, a table including the prime minister and, you know, the president of France and, you know, Mr. Trump and G7 leadership speaking directly to these leaders for the first time about how they could improve uh, the well-being of women and gender diverse folks and what they stood to gain as a result of strengthening women's participation, both economically and socially. So I was able to, in many ways, create a dream job. Uh, and remember, I was coming out of a pretty, pretty intense, pretty difficult first year. And so that new role, that new opportunity very much allowed me to advance what I have known to be my North Star in life to improve outcomes for women and their families. And it's an opportunity that I'll always be grateful that I'll never forget. And you kept that uh, position for the balance of uh, your political career. Yes, I hope very much that I would. And I did. I got, you know, a little bit into it, about a year into the role, the prime minister asked me to take on, in addition to the role for women and gender equality, the role of Minister for International Development. Uh, and that was pretty cool. Uh, you know, aside from putting into, into place uh, innovative funds like the Equality Fund and stepping up so that Canada would be the number one investor in women's organizations around the world and the number one investor in sexual rights, health rights, and reproductive rights with Thrive. Um, I was the convener of the single largest gathering of feminists on the planet in the 21st century with Women Deliver in Vancouver. Um, and that was exciting. And then after that, after the 2019 election, the prime minister asked me to take on, in addition to women and gender equality, the role of the Minister for Rural Economic Development, where I designed and implemented the single largest program, and I'd say well, probably one of the most successful uh, in Canada's history to get Canadians connected to high-speed internet. So really incredible opportunities that help get over the fact that I'm not there anymore, right? As we speak, people have access to high-speed internet who didn't before. And as we speak, women and children have a safe place to go to in their darkest hours, a door that may not have been open to them before. Hundreds 
if not, you know, over 1,500 organizations in the country are better funded because of the work that my team and I were able to do there. And that helps to cope with what is no longer my job, just knowing that that impact lives on, which is why I'm encouraging your listeners, you know, running with all the risks that it comes, running for a political position is totally worth it because democracy works. Yes, you may lose and you ought to make peace with that possibility, but if you win and when you win, you get to make a world of difference in a country like Canada where there are opportunities and democracy is pretty healthy and the more different people engage, the healthier and the stronger it gets. We're chatting with uh, the Honourable Maryam Mossef. She's a former Liberal uh, Member of Parliament, a former Cabinet Minister. Uh, she's written a fascinating article about uh, about losing, um, and uh, she's got an incredible experience, uh, both a winning and uh, and and a challenging experience uh, uh, in the last election. But that experience in itself is uh, is a great example of resilience and uh, and fighting and and continuing along. Uh, and so it's a real pleasure to meet uh, you and and chat with you. We're going to take a break for some messages, and um, and you've got a connection, I understand, with both. Uh, uh, Iran and Afghanistan. And so I want to come back after uh, the break and chat a little bit about those two countries and what's going on because they're obviously in the news big time uh, right now. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour in Second and Sixty. My guest tonight is the Honorable Maryam Amasef, a former Liberal Cabinet Minister uh, in the, the prior Justin Trudeau uh, uh, government uh, doing uh, two terms uh, in uh, in both parliament and in cabinet. Uh, she's uh, just warned me that she's uh, uh, newly married and newly pregnant. And so congratulations on uh, on both those uh, things. And I think your uh, husband is uh, is also got a political background. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Matt DeCourcy was the member of parliament for Fredericton. And it's not so new anymore. Uh, we got married over the summer and baby baby announcement was made last month so i'm sorry i missed that i apologize but uh, congratulations thank you so much so i understand uh, you um, have an afghanistan background you were born in iran uh, so you've got connections to both of those countries um afghanistan has obviously been really big in the news in the last little while because of the pullout uh, last summer of uh, of all the troops um and what has happened uh, to uh to uh Women's rights uh, in Afghanistan is like, frankly, everything. Um, uh, and uh, and then um, in the last uh, little while, uh, Iran and women's rights uh, in Iran is almost right at the top uh, of the sort of the international agenda, other than maybe Ukraine, with uh, with uh, with the killing of uh, of a young lady. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, your role in uh, in both those countries and uh, what you think about uh, about the the status of women in those both those countries and the status of politics in both those countries, if you could. Well, I've played a insignificant role in both those countries. I was born to Afghan parents as an Afghan refugee on Iranian soil. And we spent time between borders, but it wasn't safe in Afghanistan and we weren't necessarily welcomed in Iran. There wasn't much of a future for my mom who had lost her husband at 24 and now had three little girls to look after. Not much opportunity for three little girls who are raised without a male head of household in that part of the world. So she made the decision to come to Canada. And I've been in Canada since I was 11. I've been an Afghan Canadian since I was 16. Uh, and I've tried to do my part to support the women uh, and girls of Afghanistan, uh, you know, for some time. But it's it's a drop in the bucket what I've been able to do. Um, the status of women in Afghanistan has deteriorated. Women and their experiences are erased in so many ways. The Taliban have won so much and women and girls have lost 20 years of advancement. And those hard won gains had, were taken away almost overnight. And it's inspiring to see them persist and resist and refuse to give up because they have seen what is possible 
because they have been educated by the international community, including Canadians. And in a very short period of time, they made so much progress. They advanced so much. And that is where I get my hope. I still work with Afghan women, particularly, particularly those who are in leadership positions and are now rebuilding and, you know, reorienting themselves wherever they are in the world to the challenge back home. Uh, and as for the status of women in Iran, I, like so many, am both horrified to see how uh, things are escalating against the resistance and those who are pushing for uh, freedom for women uh, and for, you know, Zan Zendegi Azadi for life. Um, and I'm also inspired to see particularly young people, most especially young women who also have their male allies with them in Iran, around the world, including in Afghanistan. It's inspiring to see them push because they're not just fighting for themselves. They're fighting for all of us, whether they're fighting against the Taliban's oppression in Afghanistan or whether they're fighting against the regime that oppresses women in Iran. These women are speaking up for all of us. We're... Um... We were the West. Was uh, Canada and the United States right to uh, to leave Afghanistan? Not in the way we left. No, no. The women warned us. They said the Taliban have not changed for the better. In fact, they've become more cru cruel and more extreme. They warned us that handing them over to the Taliban was going to only end up in pain and in suffering and in unspeakable violence and atrocities, they were right. And they warned us that the Taliban may say something like, yeah, yeah, I will abide by certain rules, but there was nothing binding them to those rules. And we should have listened to them. And the consequence now, even if the oppression stops right now, even if we create the conditions where there is an opportunity to rebuild. There's decades of work to be done now to undo the harm that's been done over the past year and to build in the systems that can withstand any such oppression and uh, extremism moving forward. So no, we could have, as a global community, done better by the women, starting with listening to them. What, uh, if anything, should the West do in regards to uh, the situation in Iran and morality police and uh, human rights infractions? Well, look, I'm I'm by no means an expert on the plight of Iranian women, but it is heartwarming to see leadership around the world stand up in solidarity with Iranian women. Uh, I think that if you were asked me, if you were to ask me the same question about Afghanistan and the women of Afghanistan, I'd say, first of all, be mindful that Afghanistan is the most dangerous place in the world for journalists. So we're not hearing what's happening to women in Afghanistan. And an international inquiry on the status of women and minorities in Afghanistan is necessary so that their experiences are not erased and forgotten. Second, I would say, stop the Hazara genocide. There's an ethnic and religious minority in Afghanistan, the Hazaras, who have for decades been under oppression and have experienced all sorts of discrimination, but particularly recently under Taliban rule, it's hard to ignore that they're deliberately being targeted when schools filled with little girls are blown up and you can see very clearly that these are little Hazara girls uh, and that it's happening in places of worship as well as institutions, in hospitals. Uh, you know that it's a targeted effect uh, and that they're trying to erase a peoples. And so stop that. The international community has the power to do that. There are opportunities and obligations to get humanitarian aid to Afghans right now. It, winter is here and it's a difficult winter and aid has not been delivered to the extent that it could have been, that it should have been to the front lines, to those who need it most. And so children particularly 
are at risk. So there are things that the global community can do. Um, and I would go back to what we should have done, which is start with listening to the women, the women we trained as a global community, the women we empowered to say, take up leadership roles, we've got your back. Those women are still standing up, they're still resisting, they're still advocating, they have solutions. And when we create platforms for them, like some post-secondary institutions have done here in Canada through fellowships, we give many, many people in Afghanistan a platform for change through the opportunities we give these women leaders. This um, ethnic group I wasn't familiar with before. Please uh, tell us a little about, uh, is it a different uh, religious or geographic or, or, or why is it a ethnic group that is, uh, that is uh, um, set upon by the Taliban? Well, this is a religious minority. These are Shia Muslims. So they make up a minority of Muslims in Afghanistan. Uh, and they uh, certainly, you know, you see a lot of them um, as refugees all over the world in places like Iran and their strong communities here in Canada. Uh, but they also live, continue to live in Afghanistan and you know the the Taliban have very strict ideologies uh, and a very strict mandate and it does not include women it does not include Hazaras it does not include Shias and by eradicating uh, this resilient uh, communities of people this re resilient ethnic and re religious minority they are fulfilling their mandate to reduce the diversity in Afghanistan. And so if, you know, it's a little known uh, piece of the hardship and the violence that Afghans are experiencing, particularly right now, one, because there's so much happening. We know girls aren't little girls no longer can go to school. It's the only place in the world where they've said you can't go to school anymore after, you know, you're, you know, close to puberty girls, so stay at home. Uh, we know about that, but what we don't know is that Hazaras in Afghanistan every day are under threat uh, and you know they're they're being erased in violent ways. And the global community has an obligation to understand and to learn more about them. I encourage anyone who's interested to Google Hazara genocide. The hashtag recently garnered tens of millions of supports um, around the world and protests ongoing in Canada and around the world to raise the, um, to, to turn the attention of the global community to the plight of Hazaras. Well, thank you for educating us. I didn't. Uh, I think I'm reasonably well read, and I didn't know uh, that background, so I appreciate that. And it's it's uh, it's you know maybe equally uh, negative that uh, this young lady in Iran that was murdered was uh, Kurdish, and uh, and so therefore there's not only uh, sexual uh, uh, sex violence based on on sex, but uh, violence based on uh, ethnic uh, religious minorities in, in 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 Iran, and it seems to be a, a problem worldwide. Um, you know, the other thing that you know, has sort of come out um, is the plight of females in uh, in Ukraine and uh, sexual violence that is used as a as a as a way of uh, negatively impacting uh, the occupied uh, population. We're hearing about rape. We're hearing about uh, sexual assault. We're hearing about murder. Um, what do you think about the status of women today in the world? My goodness. Um, so one of one of the most memorable conversations I had in my time as international development minister was with representatives from Ukraine and where we bonded. Um, and, you know, I remember it was a productive meeting, uh, you know, around status of women and the work they were doing to build democracy and around development supports that Canada um, was offering then and, of course, continues to this day. But one of the areas where we um, connected with the representatives at the time to the point of getting emotional uh, was they were rebuilding what had been broken and they were piecing it all back together. And they were so proud of it and they had seen what had been lost. And, you know, when when 
Russia invaded Ukraine back in February, I just went back to that memory of, my God, it is so incredibly painful to watch what has been pieced back together lovingly with care, with dedication, to see it be broken again. Uh, and certainly as a weapon of war, violence against women uh, and children is unfortunately all too common. It's why Canada was one of the big advocates for women, peace and security uh, and the resolution 1325 at the UN. If we turn away from these violations, if we look away, if we pretend like they don't happen, if we just say, well, that's just how it is. Those who commit these crimes, when they get away with it with impunity, they don't stop. They grow emboldened and that movement uh, that doesn't respect women, that wants to erase women, that movement grows beyond the borders in which those crimes occur. And we see that happening all over the world. We've seen here in Canada, irresponsible leaders actively courting misogynists in their bid to win power. And, uh, you know, that's, we think it's happening in one part of the world, but one of the things that I've learned particularly from the plight of Indigenous women, uh, is that, you know, the status of women, the status of democracy in one corner of the world is the canary in the mine for the rest of us. And Afghanistan taught us this too, right? If a group of terrorists can walk into a capital and overthrow a democratically elected government, and undo decades of hard-won gains for women in one part of the world, there's nothing holding them back from doing the same in another part of the world. Indeed, we saw them try that in the US, we saw them try that in Canada, and we gotta be vigilant. And when I say the women in Iran and Afghanistan are standing up for all of us, they're waking us all up to just how fragile democracy is, and they're waking us all up to everyday atrocities that chip away at women's rights in the name of this is what a regime wants to do. And we all got to be on guard for that. We're chatting tonight with the Honorable Maryam Monsef. She uh, has embarked on a new uh, future, and we're going to come back after a two-minute break and find out what she's doing now and what the future holds for her. And we're also going to touch on her lessons about resilience. Stay with us, everybody. I got to tell everybody, it is a real honor uh, tonight to be chatting with uh, the Honorable Marianne Massef. She's a former Liberal Member of Parliament from Peterborough. She's a former Cabinet Minister. She had some really tough roles uh, and probably some interesting roles. And uh, and uh, and she lost in the last election. And I think that's a real shame. Uh, but she's written about that loss and uh, and she's embarked on a new future. So tell us, um, uh, Ms. Massef, if you could, a little bit about uh, what you're doing now. You're CEO of your own business, I understand. It. Yes. And that business is called Onward. And after a period of reflection and what some may call an eat, pray, love journey post that election loss, um, I was able to pull together a team and build a business. And the focus of the business is offering personal and professional development opportunities to emerging leaders and existing leaders, particularly women and gender diverse folks, so that, you know, personally for me, they don't have to learn everything through trial by fire like I did so that they have the tools and the skills to succeed around the table once they get there. Uh, and when women are doing well, when women are around leadership uh, tables, making decisions, we all benefit. The economy grows and certainly we could benefit from greater economic growth. We have greater labor participation and we can all agree that labor shortages right now require us to step up our game to strengthen our labor uh, force and, you know, better decisions are made. And so, you know, I didn't want to lose an election and you know, have little girls and little boys who are watching who would write me letters and still write to me to this day, be afraid of stepping up and saying, I can do this. I can achieve the impossible. I can be a strong voice around those decision making tables. I didn't want to, you know, become a cautionary tale. Instead, I want particularly young people to see that 
if you have big dreams in life, that's a good thing. But be prepared also for big risks. Be Just accept the fact that setbacks are part of the formula. And the best thing you can do, your best act of resistance is to get up, fall after fall, dust yourself off, figure out what you could have done differently, continue to surround yourself with good people, learn the skills you wish you had, and then get back out there because the world needs you. And my business allows me to do that. Folks invite me into their team retreats to speak to their teams. Uh, I get invited as a keynote speaker, as a panelist, uh, but I also hold, along with my own team, workshops and retreats for women, uh, both one-on-one -on -one and as groups, so that we can build their confidence and their skills to keep rocking it. Sounds fantastic. And so your advice if someone loses a job, uh, particularly a big job, uh, and publicly is, is what? Get up again? Get a good team? Well, I'll tell you what I did. Um, get a good counselor. Get a good coach. I spent a lot of time on the yoga mat and the prayer mat. Write a lot. Uh, you know, get your thoughts out on a journal. Yeah, surround yourself with people who care about you. I took a time out. I spent three weeks and I didn't talk to anybody. And I'm a people person. And you've heard me talk and talk today. So you can appreciate how hard that was. But I needed to just be in my own head and to answer the questions of, am I still me? Do I still like me? Am I still pursuing my path along my North Star? And I needed that time to reflect so that I could realign and have a purpose for getting back up and moving forward and look around you. Most of us, if not all of us, come from a long line of resilient women and men. So look to their example and to those who never gave up. Nothing good has ever come easy. You think it was easy for women to get the right to vote? For Indigenous people to get the rest of us to begin to understand the true history of this place we call home? None of the good things and the important things that have come socially have come easily. And there's examples to be found all around us. Does your company have a website that people should go to if they want to uh, hire you or come to one of your retreats or workshops or something? Yes. Visit mariammonsef.com. Excellent. I got to ask you, last question. Are you going to run again? Never say never. We're chatting today with the Honorable Marianne Monsef, who says never say never. Um, I think that uh, Canada needs you in uh, in a very strong leadership position, whether that's in Parliament or in business or uh or just inspiring us with your conversations because uh, you are a very inspiring young lady and uh, going to be a, a wonderful mom, I, I am sure. Um, and I think that we're probably going to see you in Parliament again in a very senior position. I look forward to uh, to that. It's been a real pleasure meeting you and chatting with you tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Brian. That's our show for tonight, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I remind you I'm on 6 o'clock every night on 960 AM. You can stream me online, even from Peterborough, where my best friend lives. Uh, at www.saga960am.ca. Good night, everybody.